Well, good day. We're looking at um, covenants, the uh, an overview of covenants, and this is week one. And we want to look at uh, quite a few different aspects to do with the background of covenants. And then over the next few weeks, we will specifically look at different covenants. We'll have a quick look at the everlasting covenant, then move into the Edenic covenant on uh, next Wednesday. And uh, it's something that is uh, crucial because to get an understanding of covenants gives us an understanding of God's dealing with man, with creation, uh, with uh, time even, I suppose. It, it, it's God's method of showing his love, mercy, and grace to uh, his creation. Um, I wrote here, it's the God's chosen method of dealing with his creation. It's the basis whereby he deals with mankind. And we will see that God's covenant and covenants in general apply to people, nations, to humanity. It deals with natural and spiritual creation. Um, it's just something which is the method in which God has chosen. And as you understand what a covenant is and the power of it, we begin to realize it's more than just a legal contract. It is a life contract that's legal by all means, but it's an exchange of life. It's a, a, a commitment from the living God, the all-powerful, almighty, all-seeing, all-giving, God, all-loving, the goodness of God that is committed to fulfill what he has covenanted. Now, the word covenant can be, we, we've talked, there's many ways in which to interpret it, but the uh, one word that is being used is to cut. It means that there is a, a physical condition that's in, imbibed. There is a cutting. And if you go into blood covenants and um, blood brothers and so on, as we used to see on old movies and, and we'll talk about one that uh, uh, an actual fact that took place in Africa years ago, um, that we find that this word to cut actually means that we are committed even to the shedding of blood. And we'll find that uh, these covenants all have an element of bloodletting or sacrificial death or a substitutional death or whatever. So covenants are not just a contract, but they are life and death that uh, they involve um, blood in some form or another. And we'll talk about that as we go through in just a few minutes. Now, <laughs> one of the things that's interesting about these is that if you understand covenants, then you understand how God uses and God's ways and methods. Um, I think that probably one of the great things in the church today is for us to come to a place to understand how God actually works and how God uh, God's ways. Um, it says in uh, the Psalms, it says that God showed his ways to Moses or his acts to Israel, but his ways to Moses. And uh, we find that God even used Moses in the cutting of a covenant. Um, uh, later on, we'll see that in our, in our studies. But it, it's, the, it's the way that it, it's the, to bring a understanding of God's ways. We just said that, but it's to fulfill and to um, God's heart so that his heart is expressed in a very strong way in which we have a confidence that we are going to receive and God is going to do what he said he is going to do. It's like the guarantee. It's the, it's the absolute total commitment of what God wants to do. In Hebrews chapter 6, there's a very interesting verse, and it says, um, uh, just picking it up in verse 16, he says, Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us and goes on about the anchor of our soul. Immutable means unchanging, that there are two unchanging things that God has committed. And one of them is his promise. The other one is by an oath. And so whenever you look at covenant, you'll see an oath is involved in it, that God not only made a promise, 
but he made an oath. And uh, oaths are, uh, are more than just a legal contract. Oaths bring in about blessing and cursing. Um, when you take an oath, you take an oath as to the blessing that comes with obedience, but you also are accepting the consequences of those things if you do not fulfill them. And it says there that God has taken two immutable things. One is the fact that he um, makes a promise. The other one is that he has sworn an oath. And it says there to go on to say these two immutable things are guaranteed because God cannot lie so when god's made a covenant it is the guarantee that god is not lying that god has made a promise but not only that he has but cut covenant as a sign of an oath that he will fulfill what he has promised to do the the issue with covenants is so strong that it is all the way through human history and i want to say this because i think it's important that um, every culture and every nation, every tribe, um, every civilization in history has some form of blood covenant. They all have this issue. If you go to the Aboriginal people in Australia, they will have areas where they have animal sacrifice. They will have areas where they would inflict um, a wound and a, a mark of the covenant would be on the body of a person and so on. But right back to uh, tribal people um, in every nation. And my personal understanding of that is that the further you go back into, and I, I don't know what the political correct word is for this, but the more primitive the nature, uh, the, the, the tribe is or the, or the national people, the closer they are to the core values of creation. So that there is this something that was put into humanity of the value and the importance of a blood covenant or a this area of blood sacrifice that was necessary and we won't we'll get into it next week but there's the fact that god slew the animals and covered the fallen adam with um animal skins and so there was this blood sacrifice that covered the sin of adam and eve in the beginning and so we have, that was the first foundation. And from that, every tribe and people group down through the centuries have traced it back to that. I wrote here that it's the, the core values can be traced back to the events of history and the events of, uh, I believe, early creation. Um, so the blood covenant isn't just something that's in the Bible. It's all the way through history and we'll find it in every, every culture. Um, so these things are very important. The, the, the covenant was the basis whereby God would dwell on the earth. If, if next week we'll look at the Edenic covenant, which is the covenant God made with, with Eden, and we call it the Edenic covenant for the one of a better name. And in there we find that, that that's where God was going to dwell. And we see that he sat down and on the Sabbath began to rule and to reign um and so that's like a temple it's like the dwelling place the temple we find it in the mosaic covenant there was this tabernacle that was to be built and uh so on and then the, the davidic and so on that there would be a temple that would be built and we go right through into the new covenant and again he says i will dwell with them and they will be my people and i will and that they become the church becomes the new temple of the holy spirit the new dwelling place of god and so as a means for god to dwell amongst his people there is always a covenant contract or a covenant uh <laughs> situation with with blood with priesthood and so on that was involved in it um and we'll talk about the edenic um and you'll see there that um that the priests were the mean adam and eve and the and the whole concept of the blood sacrifice and so on that we find later on in the Adanic covenant. So there's a temple focus. And in that temple focus, we have this area in which uh, the covenant was the basis for the sacred space or the sacred space where God will occupy and bring his glory and manifest his presence to his people. Nothing's changed. 
If we were to go through all the covenants, we see that that was the purpose that he wanted to do through into the new covenant, where which is sealed in Jesus' blood and the permanency of the presence of God in the midst of his church. And the church becomes a sacred space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so these things are a, a covenant that is cut. Um, and we will find that the term covenant is a uh, major covenants we'll look at. We'll look at some minor covenants, hopefully at some stage during our study. But you'll find that covenants are between God and men, or God and mankind, should I say. Um, God even makes covenant with individuals. But there's also tribes that make covenants with other tribes. Nations make covenants with other nations. And we find that even in, uh, in, in, in humanity, there is a covenant between man and woman called marriage. And um, if we were to look at every culture, every culture has marriage in some form or another. Sometimes it's uh, uh, poly, um, were they poly, poly wives, is it? No, not poly wives, <laughs> but multitudes of wives. And, but it's still, they're wives. They have a special recognition in their, um, in their culture. Um, and it could be the, the one man, one woman situation. But within that, there is this swearing of an oath, uh, the vow, we call it vows, you know, uh, say this after me. And um, we, we commit and we make a vow towards it. But the interesting thing about our Christian marriage when we say it is that we'll use words like this and let no man tear us under. What God has joined together, let no one tear us under. So within that marriage, there is three compartments, three people. There's the man, the wife, and the, and God, and then is represented by the minister, and there's this declaring and decreeing and pronouncement that takes place, and that covenant is then sealed by the act of intimacy, and if we really were to get nitty-gritty with all this, that the first act of intimacy is meant to have a flow of blood, which is a sign of a blood covenant between the man and the woman, and so there is this in a perfect world, these things would be, but it indicates that God has considered these things to be covenant and put it within human kind to do that. Um, we find that it's to deal with marriage, it deals with justice, it deals with appeasement, it deals with areas of uh, so many aspects, uh, a covenant that is always throughout human history and human um, interaction. <coughs> so we're going to look at the ingredients that make a covenant we'll look at them very quickly and that we will see that the job of the prophets in the old testament and in the new testament too but particularly in the old testament was that the prophets would speak to a people who are under a particular covenant whether it be abrahamic or davidic or mosaic or whatever and they would speak to bring the people back under that covenant because that is the way that God relates to people, relates to them. And so when we look at the nation of Israel and the formation of that nation through Abraham and so on, we find that God wants to cut covenant with these people. Now, you will see later on that the term Gentile comes up where God wants to bring them in to the new covenant, to bring the Gentile in. Now, the word Gentile means non-Jewish, non-Israeli or whatever. But in actual fact, it means non-covenanted, people who are outside the covenant. So if you are a Christian and you are now in the new covenant, then you are not a Gentile any longer, but you are, they in, in Jewish terms, you might be, but in God's terms, you are now covenanted, a covenanted people. And that's an important thing that takes place. So we, we, we're going to look at the, the three conditions in just a minute. But also, I just want to say a few things about this. Um, his, historically, covenants are extremely important because God himself originally cut the first covenant with himself. And we, we theologically call that the everlasting covenant. And uh, we will touch on that next week in more detail. But I think that was in place before and then we find that god has brought these other covenants in there and they really form two two categories 
the or three really the everlasting covenant overshadows all of them but the within that we have this creative covenant and we also have a redemptive covenants and the creative covenant would be the edenic covenant in the creation when god formed the the, the earth and the heavens and the earth and formed it and so on, all that. Then we find that after the flood, that the um, Noahic covenant to a sense is a renewed creative covenant. Although it's redemptive as well, it has a creative element to it. And so these covenants really form into two categories, creative and redemptive, right through to the new covenant, which is totally redemptive and the everlasting covenant, which again is overshadows all the covenants. And wherever you hear the word everlasting, see the word everlasting, it relates to this overall beautiful picture of God making a covenant with himself uh, in the council and the, and, the, and the divine council of God, he made a covenant with himself. And we'll talk about that next week, but ultimately at the end of our studies, we will do a whole intent a study on the um, everlasting covenant. But here's the point. Historically, it goes right back to before creation. We have two categories, basically, that we'll be looking at, creative and redemptive. But here's what I want to bring out. That God makes covenants with men, with mankind. And it's always initiated by God. It's always initiated. God shows his will and desire to man and then his desire for man to adhere to it. It's um, never the other way around. It's never man makes a covenant with God. It's always God makes a covenant with man, which is interesting. You can have covenants with men with men. You can have, and I said to you before, that we have it within marriage as well. Um, in one place there, in Job, Job says, I'll make a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a maiden. And um, so he makes a man can make a covenant within himself, which is one of these lesser covenants, but it does talk about a, a commitment to um, a pure lifestyle. Um, and you find that even the devil's agent, ain't, ain't agents will try to make covenants with God's people, and we see that. We'll use some of those examples at some stage. But Nahash made try to make a covenant with the people and uh, Saul rose up and said, no, no, don't, we're not going to pluck out your right eye um, and, and rescued them. It's quite, quite an powerful, powerful thing. But let me just do a little sidestep here. Um, there's a thing called the Covenanters that took place in the 1600s, I think it was 1638. They, the nobles and the ministers and some of the everyday people uh, cut a covenant at uh, um, the, uh, when the Kirks in the centre of uh, Edinburgh back in 1638, and they all signed it and so on. And it was a, basically a covenant that the, they had written. We've got, they call them the Covenanters. Um, and although it was a grand gesture and it was a great thing and God, to a certain extent, honoured it, um, it really wasn't a... God covenant because it was not initiated by God because God would cut the covenant. God would write the covenant. God would speak the covenant and it would be established. It was a great covenant from man to man. And I think that God honored it. But um, in regards to a covenant that we're talking about in scripture, it's God that cuts that covenant with man, not the other way around. And, um, I, as much as I greatly respect what they did and so on, and I think that uh, they were the roots of great in revival in Scotland, um, to say it was a covenant from God well, it would not be a correct interpretation of it. So there's different points to consider to do with covenants, and we'll look at them in just a sec. Um, covenants are not to be made with other gods to worship Baal, to honour other gods was absolutely forbidden. And you'll see the consequences of a nation when they worshipped other gods, they forsook and they went whoring after other gods um, and they uh, destroyed the covenant of what we would call believing loyalty. That really, 
the great strength of the covenants, and we'll see this as we go through them, but I'll just make this point, is that the covenants are empowered by God. That God gives grace within them. God gives mercy within them. God realizes that we are that we are we 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 are frail and that we will fail, but <laughs> He gives us grace. But the main thing is that we stick to a believing loyalty within that covenant, and ultimately, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the conditions that are required by all the covenants, and we find that you know He becomes Abraham's seed, He becomes David's greatest son, He becomes the Messiah, the King, and so on. And so he's the fulfillment of all those covenanted promises. So when we are in covenant with God, we become bearers of his name. Now, all humanity are in the image of God. We are all image bearers. He made man in his own image, in his own likeness, made him man and all that stuff. And we are his image bearers. And the goal of man is to... Uh, to be image bearers, in other words, to reflect God, to be his image in the earth. And, um, you know, even the Bible says even um, somebody that's, that's not walking with God still carries the image of God within them. But the difference between an image bearer just by the sake that they're human, which is what human beings are, and a, someone who bears his name is the difference between someone who is just living within the grace of God the existing and someone who is in covenant with God. In the New Testament, of course, we come into covenant through faith in Jesus Christ. But anyone who is in covenant was to bear his name. It was to have his name upon them, to be surnamed by God. And, um, and that there puts a whole new meaning on this concept of do not take the Lord's name in vain, that we are in covenant with him. Therefore, the name of the Lord is born upon us and it's something that's very very important to understand the covenant brings us into his name and all that his name represents in that way so we are in his name and in his name isn't a catchphrase in his name is an identity bearing his name the name of god upon them now what does covenant reveal to us covenant reveals to us God's love, grace, and mercy. Um, God is a covenant-making God. He made covenant with Noah, Abraham, David, the house of Israel. Even the new covenant is uh, firstly announced to the house of Israel. This is the covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel, and so on. Um, there is he's a, He makes the covenant. The second one is that he's the keeping of the covenant. He, he promises, as we said there, his promises and his oath, and that God will not lie. And we have that reflected. One of the greatest reflections that God is keeping his promise is the Noahic covenant, where he said that the rainbow, every time I see the rainbow, I will remember my covenant. I will remember the, my promise. I will remember the oath that I will never destroy the earth with water again. And so God's keeping that, that covenant. Uh, that's just one example, and we go through many examples as our time goes on. Um, he reveals it. It's very clear that, that he really re reveals it to the people. His covenant is not, not wishy-washy or um, hard to understand. It's very clear, and he makes it very clear, and it's usually announced and then written. In some places, it talks about a, a book of the covenant, but it's, a, it's written in some way. We have it recorded in our Old Testament and New Testament, these words that God has spoken to people and has written and if there was any doubt in the people, God sent prophets to bring them back under the conditions of the covenant, to remind them of the covenant, to remind them of what God had said and what God expected. And so the prophets were to bring them back. The, set, the last thing there was when he was enabling it by grace and ultimately by sending his own son in the likeness of human flesh, he fulfilled all the requirements of the condition. So when we see these covenants from God, not only do they come from him, but he also empowers them and ultimately fulfills them by grace in our lives and by the sending of his own son to fulfill it. Okay, it gives us the binding sense of commitment of both parties. Of uh, A covenant gives the binding sense of commitment of both parties.
the blessings and the curses are usually incurred with that. If you bless with it, you will also be cursed with it. There is a, a great story of uh, a guy called David Livingston. David Livingston, of course, was the great explorer missionary who was uh, credited for some of the great discoveries uh, in Africa and great exploring. But one of the two of the things that probably most people don't really realize is that he was a great, um, a great missionary. He was the preaching the gospel throughout Africa, but he also was an abolitionist of the slave trade and was releasing slaves all over the place and uh, incredibly strong in those areas. Um, and one day there was a guy called Mr. Stanley who was sent to try and find him. And uh, there's that famous story, isn't it, of uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume, and they met in the middle of the African jungle. But here's the concept that took place. And, and it's very difficult to know exactly which story is the absolute correct one. But the one I, I'm led to believe is that Mr. Stanley, on his search for um, Livingston, came across a, a tribal chief. And the tribal chief was not very impressed, didn't want him to come through, didn't want anything to do with him. They were, he considered him an enemy and was hostile. And the guide that was with Mr. Stanley said, cut a covenant with him, cut a blood covenant with this chief and uh, things will change. So he goes and the two men, the chief and Mr. Stanley, cut a covenant with one another. There was an incision made um, in both their hands. They shook hands, blood was exchanged. I think blood went into a, some sort of a vessel and, and they, they drank um, wine or some sort of juice or something with it. And there was this covenant. Now, the sign of the covenant was that Mr. Stanley had a milking goat because he had a bad stomach and whatever. And, uh, and the chief said, I want that milking goat. And so Mr. Stanley objected, no, no, I don't want to give you it. And so, but ultimately he gave him the milking goat. And the chief gave him a spear. And that spear, that spear was only a, uh, a spear with a sort of a copper thing on the top. And he thought to himself, what on earth am I going to do with this spear? So he goes off into the jungle. And everywhere he went, whenever tribes saw that spear, they gave in and yielded because they realized that he was in covenant with the greatest chief of that area and everything that he needed was within that covenant he had the representation of his relationship through covenant blood covenant with this tribal chief and everything history tells us that stanley and livingston both said that there is no record of anyone ever breaking a blood covenant in africa during those days there may be records now but they did not know in fact if you broke that covenant you would be hunted and your family would be hunted and killed because of the blessing and the curse of the covenant. And that is just a human tribal representation of the strength of covenant, that when you are in covenant with the living God, whether it be Old Testament and so on, or whether now in the New Testament, there is a exchange of our life for his, our values for his values. And there is this uh, relationship that is bound in that way so that if you touch one you touch the other and it's very very um, strong and that's a great example of it I'm going to finish with just a, a very quick um, three or four points here one is the the structure of covenants follow a very simple pattern and we'll find that we'll mention priesthood we'll mention uh, laws and so on and ceremonies and so on but the basic elements of them are this. There is the words, which is the promises of God. There is the blood sacrifice, which is always involved in some level. And then there's a seal that is a sign of the covenant. And these three things will be repeated all the way through each of the covenants. And so the words usually are written or spoken, or they're spoken and then written, and they to do with promises and they will include things like this blessings and curses they will include in especially god speaking covenants they will include natural and national temporal spiritual and or eternal they will they will they will deal with sometimes time sensitive 
Sometimes it'll be national sensitive. Sometimes it'll be uh, just specific um, situations that are there. So, but the promises are there. And there'll be the terms um, that are within the, that are spoken. It will be that the God, like things like the, the terms of the contract, I'll give you an example, is the ones that says, I will be their God and they will be my people. So the role, God will be their God and you will be my people. That's two terms of the contract, the two terms of the covenant that are there. That's just an example, um, the terms of the contract. And then you have the oath that comes with it. It confirms it. And we talked about that. It's irrevocable. It's something which cannot be changed. And, and in God's case, he has by two immutable forces. One is he's promised and the other is the oath. And yet God cannot lie. It's a means that he has done that. The next one is that there is the blood sacrifice of the covenant. So we have the word or the, um, the written spoken word and that contained all that I just said. The second one is the blood, the blood which is the sacrifice of the covenant. It's in, it's, in other words, what it's trying to say is the covenant isn't just wishy-washy. It is life and death situations. Mm -hmm. If you, you get into the new covenant and begin to study, which we will do, you will begin to realize that if you accept it, you receive life, mm -hmm. eternal life. If you reject it, you receive eternal death. And um, these are these are powerful things. So the sacrifice of is always accompanied with a blood sacrifice. Uh, sorry, covenant is always accompanied with a blood sacrifice because it's reminding us always that there is a that's an importance. There's always a body and there's always blood which is shed. And uh, we'll see that again in many of the different ones. The next thing is there's a mediator. Of the, of the covenant and that'll be a, a priest or a high priest or sometimes it's a minister in some form or another but there is a mediator and of course we have those terms don't we in the new testament there is one mediator between god and man god and men the man christ jesus and so we have this mediator this one who in, implements it that goes between and brings the parties together and there's always a sanctuary which is either an altar or the temple, or something like that. So the blood sacrifice always relates to the, the sacrifice itself, to a mediator, and to the sanctuary of where this thing takes place. And the, 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 the last one that is always in everyone is there's always a seal or a sign or a token. And as we go through these, we will see these different things that are there. I mean, the Abrahamic, I'm mean, sorry, the um, Noahic one, there was a sign of the, uh, of the, of the seal of the, the, the rainbow and so on. And so we'll find that each one has these particular areas. There's the promise or the word, there is the blood sacrifice of some sort, and then there is the, the seal or the sign. The last thing I want to say is, is this, and that is in our foundational Thing here and we'll look into the specifics of these things next next week um, is that there is different links that are connected with covenants there is some covenants that are everlasting um, they are um, the Abrahamic covenant is an everlasting covenant um, we find that the uh, Noahic and some of the others are, are, are definitely uh, everlasting covenants but we find that the some are transformed through the cross. The Davidic is an everlasting covenant because we find the Abrahamic goes through, comes to the cross, and then Abraham's seed, Christ, becomes the sacrifice and that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles. May they come, the, the fulfillment of God's reversal of the curse of the Tower of Babel comes through the Abrahamic promise through the now the New Testament fulfillment. We find with the Davidic covenant, the same thing, that David's greatest son sits upon the throne. And uh, so it goes on that the Davidic one, uh, they're eternal because they go through into the cross and 
expand even more. Yet some, like the mosaic, come to the cross and are fulfilled and all the sacrifices, all those things are finished and <coughs> they all represented and then we have the new covenant in that way. So they're temporal. Some are irrevocable. In other words, God um, has regarded these things and continues to do it. As I just said, is the areas of the Abrahamic and the Davidic in that way. And the other ones are ones that are revocable in many ways. Uh, the mosaic, as I said just then, and also um, one which we theologians call the Palestinian um, covenant are uh, time sensitive and fulfilled according to certain conditions. Okay, so hopefully that gives us a bit of a rough outline of, of covenants and that's the, the foundation. And from that, we will look at specific covenants and how they relate, but that's the background of what covenants and the strengths of those things in that way. Amen.